The biggest problem in security that remains unsolved is unprotected attack paths that allow threats to compromise vulnerable targets in the cloud and data center. But traditional micro-segmentation is too complex and time-consuming. There's a better approach. Edgewise Zero Trust Auto Segmentation. Edgewise is impossibly simple micro-segmentation, delivering results immediately with a security outcome that's provable and management that's zero touch. Driven by machine learning, Edgewise automatically builds policies that protect any application in any cloud without any changes to your network. They provide measurable improvement by quantifying attack path risk reduction and verifying software identity before it communicates to stop application compromises and data breaches. To see how to eliminate your network attack surface, visit securityweekly.com forward slash edgewise. Let the team at Black Hills Information Security test your defenses. With over 10 years of experience in penetration testing, red teaming, and threat hunting, the testers at Black Hills will help you find the holes in your security before the bad guys do. The team at Black Hills cares about educating and sharing their knowledge by creating countless blogs, open source tools, and webcasts for you to learn more about the tradecraft of pen testing and red teaming. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash BHIS to join their mailing list and view the latest blogs and webcasts from Black Hills Information Security. Welcome back, everyone, to Paul's Security Weekly. This is episode 615, being recorded live at Black Hat 2019. Quick announcement before we get started, and this ties into our segment, as uh, many of our listeners have told us that they're overwhelmed by the amount of content that we produce. So we're working on various software projects to uh, help that problem. You can go to securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe. If you subscribe to our listener interest lists, eventually, you will be presented with uh, an opportunity to subscribe to our insider site and get notified when content is published within your interest. A lot of back, we were talking about this before the show, yeah. a lot of backend software that myself, uh, intern Jack and I are working on, as well as additional contractors working on the WordPress side of things uh, to make all of that happen, which is uh, spawning a lot of software development here at Security Weekly, which is the, ironically enough, security of that software is the topic yeah. uh, for this segment. Awesome. So. Yeah, it's uh, it's been a wild ride. I've spent uh, the past two months primarily focused on writing software. Nice, um, good for you. I haven't done that in some time. I was gonna say, yeah, you uh, dusting off the old uh, <coughs> the tricks there. So uh, I, I, well, I started my career as a so I know. I, so I learned when I was seven. Thankfully, my parents sent me to Apple IIe in the basement of some. Uh, computer Greece. shop on Rolf Street in Cranston, Rhode Island. <laughs> wow. I don't know if you two know where that, <laughs> I know know where that is in, in Cranston. Um, and that's where I learned basic programming, right? And then in, in As college... As in the language basic. The language right, basic. Right, 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 yeah. right. Yeah, I want to clarify that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Somehow I figured that's what you meant. Um, Lotus Notes. Oh, You remember my. Lotus Notes? I do. Yes. Yeah. Unfortunately. I, I, oh. In college, I spent probably six to eight months as a full-time Lotus Notes developer working on a, wow. it was actually a point of sale system, a uh, part of that system in, in Lotus Notes. That's when I made the decision that I, I didn't want to be a full-time software developer. Love, yeah, that's how it happens. Actually. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anything to do with Lotus Notes, right? right? Yeah. And I, I love software. I love writing software, but I, I didn't want to do that as my full-time, full-time job. Right. right. And so as many of us, right, throughout your career, you're like, I really need something that does X, Y, Z. I'm going to go write something that, or download samples from the internet right. when we talked about before the internet. But once there was an internet, right, you download samples. Oh, so you program in Stack Overflow, yeah, too. Yeah, you know, <laughs> Stack Overflow. Like, you write yeah. your yeah. preferred language. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I, I did some stuff in C. I did some stuff in Java. I did Perl. And I think re- full circle, you really need to know a lot of different languages today, mm-hmm. I think, to, yeah. to have a full stack. But um, Python, right? And y- largely... You're writing scripts, right? Mm-hmm. <coughs> Larry, a lot of your software is I need to write a program for a specific purpose Task. to solve yep. a problem, right? Yep. And, and and sometimes you can take that specific problem and go, oh, well, I just don't point them here. Point it here, and it does this other thing. Like, sure. Yeah, like the, the most recent thing that I did was uh, I needed to go validate. Uh, I had was given a list of like 10,000 uh, Tor.onion addresses. And they had to go validate which ones were currently up. Yeah. So you fire up Python, you write a script. Yep. yep. To do yeah. verify what what comes back for Python four makes times so out. You are a little bit so yeah. easy. And yep. I, so I yep. did that and I'm like, well, you know what? I could just turn this to give me a list of websites and tell me which websites are up. Yeah. Like it doesn't have to be dot onion addresses. It can be any list of you websites or any and list of what, pages or most people could use that code today if you've got any infrastructure, like just knowing when your websites yep. are up or when they're yeah. It's on my GitHub page. That's awesome. Yep. Cool. Um, but now, recently, so uh, I let me start. A few years ago, 
uh, we were publishing our shows, <clears throat> and I'm like, well, there's a lot of manual work. <laughs> like, we need do, to automate dude, do you this. Remember, do you remember that? So, because we, we used to trade off every yes. other week as to <sighs> who was going to produce, it edit, was, and post uh, the shows. It was awful. And I, it would take us three days. It seems Yeah. Right. So, like, if we recorded for two or three hours, it yep. would take us six to eight hours if to make more. sure, if not more, to make sure it was published everywhere. And at some juncture, when I wanted to start doing more shows, I'm like, this ain't going to scale. No, we need to automate this. So, we started the first version. I named it. It's called PP Works. Seems as though right. Podcast <laughs> post-production <laughs> works, Gabe. Sure. Get your mind out of the gutter. Sure. <laughs> His PP, <Although> it works. <coughs> I think... <laughs> at, le- at least once or twice, right. <laughs> at least once or twice a week, we get to make the joke. Does your PP? Is your PP working? Does your PP work? Right. Yep. And Paul's got three kids. It's worked I, at least three times. I named it that just so we can make those jokes. <laughs> and All of the patches. Are so we've had CLS. like three or four developers come through and and contribute to this project. And uh, when Matt was brought on as CEO, uh, after some time, it afforded me the luxury right. where Matt was like, all right, where are we going? What is it going to do? Like all roads started leading back to, hey, that script that, you know, Paul designed and with other developers to automate production knows a lot about our business. Right. And so we started adding on to that and adding more, basically becoming the, the program that runs our business. And so I've had the luxury of spending the past two months going in and cleaning up all that code, being, for all intents and purposes, like an actual developer for the past, and not just on a script, but multiple developers in mm-hmm. a DevOps workflow that's deploying nice. containers to an application that has actual users. Because I think a big difference between when you're a pen tester, we need to write a script, you're a defender, pen tester, you need to write a script, whatever, you are the you're really the end user. You're the end user. Right. You're the only user. If you release it to other people, yeah, they're the end user, but they're running the script, modifying it, sending you stuff back. I think that's different from you've got users that are accessing the application over a web browser. That was something I hadn't experienced until I go back, like way back in my career when I was a full-time developer. And so the the lessons that I've learned, like walking a mile in a developer's shoes today, there's a you lot of great sandals, things. But yes. yes, you need sandals. <laughs> maybe barefoot. Maybe, 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 barefoot, barefoot. maybe barefoot. Crocs. Crocs. Oh, yeah. It's, it's yes. <laughs> Got to be Crocs. Paul loves Crocs. I do. Crocs did you, did are you awesome. See, did you see that they made Crocs gloves? I saw that. I did see I thought that. of you. I'm not <laughs> sure. What? what, what, what? No. Go, go uh, back yeah, to the yeah, yeah, Just keep going. Yeah, yeah, keep going. Yeah. You don't want to know, man. You don't want to yeah. know. <laughs> I'm sure there's analogies we can draw that in nope. software development. Good. But you know what? I think we're going to skip that. Yeah. Um, so essentially we've been developing a software and I really get that developer's perspective. Like when GitHub tells me, oh yeah, you've got some packages in there that are vulnerable. Like that's great. However, this publishing functionality is broken and that's why I'm committing code not to go fix the vulnerability. So I'm like, like I really get like, this is harder than you work at, we've all worked in the industry over 20 years. Like. And now I realize how hard that is to apply it's not easy. Mm-hmm. security to software. So now I get a double dumb question for you because uh, you know we've had this conversation mm-hmm. a little bit about you. Hey, we've got this feature set that we need to get published, and GitHub is telling me we have these libraries that we're using that are vulnerable. How much of it is Python that you're doing? Mm. Um, it's probably ninety percent Python. All right, now I have today. another question: Python two or three? So the app, it's it, this is a great topic for software security the yeah. uh, app i inherited was about eight thousand lines of code okay it was all in python 2.7 okay. it is the mission critical piece of software that public everyone who listens to the show that software publishes that show for everyone to listen to yep so if i mess up or jack and i mess up that software people don't get to listen to the show yep. right or if they do it's very much delayed it's a lot of work on our team so when you have to prioritize something like a security fix, the conversion from Python 2.7 to Python mm-hmm. 3, mm-hmm. that all has to – you're a product manager or have been in the past, right? Right, and right. I run a product management team now, but I also I, – I was in software security yeah. for a while, right? Like, right. I, mean, I was at White Hat for years. So you years. know the, the struggle, like – Yeah. The struggle's I real. Implement the struggle's a, real. <laughs> when I uh, picked up the, the hood – and under the covers of our application, mm. and, and you I, went, what I the cried. Fuck? I cried quite a bit, actually. Actual tears, <laughs> cried. Uh, frustration. Uh, there was heinous things like spelling mistakes and 
not quite understanding Python exception handling, not quite ex- understanding database relationships. Right. But then when you're looking at all that, like the elephant in the room is I don't have a secrets vault. I don't have security oh, testing boy. built in, in my SDLC. And I have all these <coughs> other security issues that I don't know about because I haven't really tested for them yet. Mm-hmm. But yeah. I'm still dealing with the exception handling literally not being there at all and database relationships being mm-hmm. messed up i'm like now i now i understand the struggle of taking a legacy app and pushing it forward like oh my god yeah and, and, and now not only do you have to deal with that you now have with python you have the added challenge of the platform that i've chosen to code on is no longer going to have right. updates and of yes. support as of next year and, yep. and you get to have that really awful moment when you look at something that works yeah, say this works. That's a great point. But though. it works. They publish shows. Everyone's listening to Every the show. Th- all right? I got to do is yes. hit F eight, and I can go out and get drunk. Mm-hmm. But or or I can start trying to deal with all these security handling problems. And this is why companies who who that problem is is exponentially worse mm-hmm. because it's not eight thousand lines of code. It's eighty thousand or eight hundred thousand right. yes. lines of code. Yes. And and I've I've sat in that board meeting before and and said you know they're presenting. And they're saying, we need to update this. We need to fix this. Mm-hmm. And and the management's going, what's this going to cost? And and it's just like, oh, my. And, and nobody wants to do it. You know, the developers are going, please don't make us do yeah. this. Oh, my God, because it all works, and we have so yeah. much other work to do. Can't, can't, we, can't we just take the system and put Python 2.7 on it and run it like it is without exactly. updates? Exactly. But here's the thing. I think one of the big things for me was when you want to make those changes that Doug's talking about in the boardroom and – do the conversion from 2.7 to 3, do the security updates. I think the anxiety from the developer's perspective is, if I change something, how do I know what I broke? And I think the secure software really hinges upon your ability to test that software, to say, I'm going to go make these major changes and have confidence that the build system you have Mm -hmm. is going to catch all those little things that you may have broken, yeah. right? That's why developers don't want, and I totally Nobody get it. Nobody wants now. to touch it because no. it works. It works. And it's just, I mean, if I change all, something, it could break something. But worse, we have if all I don't, had that it's feeling. It's not just that it works; it's mission critical, as he said. Yeah, it's the yeah. thing. It's that working. Makes all it's of this working happens. is a better word. It, it's working. And so there's a business decision. Yes. There. It's like, and do I do I interrupt oh the business God. and it's no the longer publish horrible. the show? awful feeling I've ever had about yes. you know technology was when the you're prom- sitting there and you're just going, I don't want to mess with this. But it's, I think it's, the, it's humming. And, and, oh, I think no. the promise is, is a big difference between I find out that it breaks once I push that new release to production mm-hmm. versus I have confidence in my test process that I'm going to catch not all. I, no, you can't, you, you'll you never can't, catch Don't ever say that. All. That's a bad thing to say. You're going to catch most of the major things in your test and QA environments, when you push to production, they're still going to find stuff. And what we've progressed to the point now is I can push a new release. The guys can still publish and they find bugs, but it's not stopping them from publishing. And that's it. And I like to get it better than that. Right. But the processes you put in place to test give you confidence to make those major changes. I'll give you uh, some real world data. It's been a while since I've kept my finger on the the pulse of this really closely. But back when I was at White Hat, we Mm. published the state of application security. Yeah. Right. Uh, report once mm-hmm. a year because you know we had thousands of web applications, right, and that we were testing, and we knew lots of things about all of the issues with all of those applications. So a lot of data that could be used in the sure. real world. In fact, a lot of that data contributed to the DBIR every year. I think yep. it still does. Um, and so my last two years there, I, I took over curating and and uh, and actually you know publishing that report. Um, well, or at least doing all the back end work, and and Jared did a lot of the heavy lift in terms of putting the story together and whatnot. And uh, one of the things that we saw with all of the issues that we find and fix, 30% of every, every single software vulnerability that we found that got closed got reopened. Mm-hmm. Got reopened. Now, it's been several years since I've, I've either read and or had my hands on that data, raw data mm-hmm, itself, mm-hmm. so I'm sure someone can go, go over there and, and figure it out. But that literally one, just under one-third of all of the work that developers were doing to fix issues were just getting reopened. And there were a number of different reasons for it because I saw it firsthand myself when I ran an AppSec program also, right? Like I would, I'd find an issue and I'd send it over to the devs and, and you know, like here's, here's what the problem is, here's what you need to go fix. And they'd fix it and then they'd do something silly. Offense to them, right? But they'd do something silly like they'd, they'd 
they'd not merge the, the the code back into the proper branch or whatever. Like they'd, they'd yeah. They'd, yeah. Oh, I've got stories about that. <laughs> right. And so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so like I'd be sitting on the end of the phone going, "Dude, bro, it's not fixed." And I'm like, "I'm banging it." And this side, I'm like, "I'm literally still breaking." It. He's like, "But I fix it right here." And he's and he's working in his environment. He's like, "Ah." Oh, I didn't merge it into the tr- – well, well, that's why it's not fixed. And the number of times these things happen. So there's about more – About 30% than, of the time. 30% of the time. And there was, <laughs> so there was okay. more to just I, I want to add on to issue. that too. So the same issue I agree, merging in branches. The other issue that I ran into when an, I inherited this code base and I looked at it was <clears throat> there was multiple ways to accomplish the same thing. Right. Yeah. There was a lot of code that should have been a function and or a method, right, that – Oh, when I publish it this way, it's this train of code. Well, you don't just use when global I d- functions for everything? No, no, no. no. <laughs> they didn't. So <laughs> when I publish it this other way, by the way, that's a different train of code. Mm. And if uh, then else. It, yeah. <laughs> if it, then but else. I, it, it, it not even just that. Just like if the user went into the interface and pushed this button, it was this train of code. But if they went in and pushed this other button, it was other train of code. The result was the same. Mm. In our case, something got published, Right. But it was two trains of code. So whether it's a bug fix, a feature, or a security You're fix. You're updating two lines, of, two trains of code. Dude, I'd go fix it, and then I'd be like, oh, they'd be like, that bug is still – same thing with security, right? And th- the interesting thing is when you have that, I would go in and put a fix in. Like, oh, that's great. And guys would be like, nothing's changed. Yeah. I changed a part of code that was <coughs> never being executed. Uh. So it was that double, double, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. uh, thing. Same, you know, different code bases doing the same thing, except this code was never being called. Right. That had my awesome error handling. Had my <laughs> awesome like security. Everything was great, except that code was never executed. It was being executed in this other code yeah. chain. So I think one of my do's and don'ts, right, is to when you're designing software, in it may sound easy for us security people to say this, but like software developers, make sure that functionality flows through very specific channels, mm-hmm. and don't try and, and try and avoid the replication of code that does the same thing. All of us have developed software; we yeah. know that's really mm-hmm. hard, right? But I think not just for bugs and features, but I realize for security, that's really important because, to Gabe's point, when I want to fix a security bug. I want to know it's fixed everywhere. If there's three functions that do similar things, I got to go fix it three times times. instead of once. And guarantee, guarantee you'll miss more than one of them. So I want to, I want to give you something good and something bad then to talk about. We were talking about this earlier. So one of the the promises of object oriented programming when when that came out was the idea that everything was encapsulated in in, sure, in polymorphism sure. and all these these you components. Can reuse the block. And right. we've seen that start to emerge. We were talking about that earlier. And we we this is the kind of stuff we talk about when we're we're hanging out, you know. Some well, people you, talk about sports, talk but about yeah, about yeah about we talk about <laughs> polymorphism. Sport, sport ball. We do. It's yeah. just sport ball. But <laughs> sport ball. It's day. the but, freedom, you know. Yeah. This shows the freedom to be nerdy. <laughs> That's <okay>? right. <laughs> but the idea of that is starting to be realized in the real world because we we were talking about how you could now build uh, Docker's or whatever objects that now those objects could be. Use the best code for the piece. So you've got all these bubbles inside your code. So you don't have to write it all in Python. You could write it in all these other little pieces. Sure. So in some ways, that turns code into a very modularized mm-hmm. thing. So it gets back to almost an, a, an analog idea of when the tube blows out, you pull it out and put a new one in. Right. So the same thing. When you find a problem, instead of having to redo the whole 8,000 mm-hmm. lines, now you go, oh, that little section there is causing a problem. Let's pull that section out and put a new one in. That version has changed. Let's plug mm-hmm. a, new, a new little bubble in there. And we can solve it with just that you know, 50 lines of code and then needs to be updated. It makes life a lot easier. So I think that a new issue that's going to come about in security is going to be the relationship between all these things. Which is something you were you were starting to talk well, about. Well, the problem's here now, right? Hold on. Well, you it is. To, yeah, it is here. But, but you also need have to like understand. serverless code now. So like you've yes. got Lambda, yeah. right? And mm-hmm. that thing is completely serverless, and yep. you may u- only use it for maybe a millisecond, maybe mm-hmm. maybe a minute, and it spins up and it it will go execute a function. It might it might access some some uh, some data. Yep. Like you may not know even what it's doing and when it did it mm, yeah. based on what someone else wrote in that thing. And because it's not it's not living, so to speak, in that big block of right. code, like, go track that down now. And I've yeah, been calling it the Lambda problem. That's the Lambda problem. Well, no, that is the Lambda problem. problem. Is it? Literally. And, and it's always been here, though. I mean, we've always had that problem of there are things out there that we don't understand that we use, 
and we don't know what they're doing. And that, I call that the Donald Lambda problem now. Is that like it, the known developers, unknowns? What, what? Developers, in your, in your model. Hand that me that bottle, please. <laughs> in your model that you're describing, developers can still make the mistake that I was describing before. Absolutely. Because don't forget now, you've got a team of developers. Developer may go into an object, write a method that's friggin' awesome. Right. Mm -hmm. As the other developer, I don't realize that method exists. Maybe I go write a Lambda function that does yeah, yeah. the yeah, same yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. Now you got, and then other developers may call the local method or may call the Lambda method. And now, this is the exact situation I was in. You've got some pieces of functionality, call one method, some right. call another method. They both do the same thing, slightly different. And But now when you've got to fix a bug or implement a feature or fix something security related, what do you do? And none of that, by the way, is a technology problem, right? That's a people in a process problem. Yes. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. Which, is, which is never it's going true. to leave us. Right. It's never right. going to leave Ooh, us. Ooh, a sci-fi thing. I had a lot of drinks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> a, a, listen, a, a sci-fi thing would be then, what if machine learning could choose the best Lambda from a giant pool no, of Lambda? No, I like that, And we just, we just toss this massive world of Lambdas out there, and the, and the machine learning chooses I'll the best Lambda. And then, what if I, and then what if I can affect the machine learning and the AI to pick the to wrong use the, damn the Lambda? the vulnerable one, spoken well, like a, a true bad fantastic. person. I'll, no. I'll take rejected it's episodes of Black Mirror for 200 yes. hours. All right. <laughs> Black Mirror <laughs> pitch number five. <laughs> yeah, may, maybe not rejected, just one for season four. Yeah. <laughs> right? It's a path in the right, latest right, season right, that right. you could find. If you're a true nerd, Choose you your find own, that. Right. <laughs> maybe yep. machine learning can find the best episode of Black Mirror for you to watch at any given point in time. I think we've got the three directors for that episode. right? right. There. My <laughs> God, we're ready. Cut. Ready for my close-up. <laughs> you're all fired. I get to be Kubrick. <laughs> I You're tell fired. you, one of the <laughs> one of the most frustrating things for me, um, we've all dealt with spelling mistakes. We've all had spell <laughs> checkers. I mean, we talked about the early technology we used. My Apple IIe had some kind of spell checker yeah. on the document writer. I don't even remember the name of it on Apple IIe, but there would, it had spell check, I don't right? Remember. Probably Word Perfect still, though. Wait, mm. Word Perfect. Oh, it was in the, in the Word days Perfect of Word Perfect. Yeah, yeah. I Good remember Word Perfect. It was God. in the days of Word yeah. Perfect, but that wasn't on no. Apple TV. Good God. Uh, DOS that based was on Word no. Perfect. You remember I that? I used to. Yeah. yeah. I had to have that little template over your F keys so you could. Yeah, the little I little used. You could <laughs> see all the functions that actually configured, like all of the formatting. Like, yeah. you had to go in there and actually. I used Word Perfect on OS 2. Oh, OS2 was you. word this, perfect. I, I promise you, there's a place. Go with God, a, my son. Right, there's a place in, 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 uh, in the afterlife That's definitely a horcrux. I need like a badge. I'm like, no, that's a horcrux. We got stick. another tattoo, Larry. That's a horcrux <laughs> if you use OS2 uh, with wait. word perfect. Oh, yeah, word no. perfect on OS2. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I think the two are separate, word perfect and OS2. Oh, I get two badges for that. Badges. Yeah. Yeah. I think you get two badges. And a third one because I use them together, right? Yes. Oh, definitely. Where was uh, I going with but that? The, I don't but remember. Now, now I get. I, I, I will also. Oh, get, I will spelling. also get. A, I will no. also get a fourth because I still have a copy of OS2 Warp. Yeah. Oh my God. Oh on, on is it on CDs or on three and a half inch floppy three disks? Three and a half inch floppy. There you oh, go. Yeah. The only way to use it. It yeah. was awesome. On my Twitter feed, I posted a picture probably a year ago at this point though, of like some old IBM PS2 uh, three and a half. I floppy yeah, I remember yeah. that. Dude, page. I remember. How did you get real cop? How did you get real things to the save icon? What the hell? Yeah. Right. 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 <laughs> Real physical copies oh, of the same icon. So yeah. spelling Did you matters. Print those? <laughs> <laughs> so you go through eight thousand lines of code, yeah. and you're debugging and troubleshooting, trying to take your first pass, and you set, you know, let's just say, your environment variable to you know production development staging. That right. that makes sense. I'm like, that's cool. So the software containers know which environment it, it is, and and it's not working. And I'm like, why isn't it not working? 45 minutes later, I realized that the entire problem was the developer thought that environment was oh no. spelled environment, hmm. and there's a computers. Those are two totally different things. Environment and environment with an Yeah, it's end. a shame. Computers are very literal, aren't like they? Like, picky about <laughs> that. If you're going to be in software development, spelling matters. Unless you're unless matters. you're misspelling your vi and your environment variables and they're like poo, or so, so your we'll, we'll developer defines new variables that are misspelled so that they can misspell them all the time. And when you try to debug that but shit, you're like, but then you wonder, like, is this a typo or? But then, if you're yeah. looking in it's multiple different files in multiple different functions, multiple different languages, because Python uses 
Jinja, right, to create HTML. And the same things that are used for different purposes are spelled incorrectly. You realize that oh my God. that person didn't know how to spell. And identifier does not contain a Y. So we were, <laughs> we were or, promised, or, or, by the way. Or doesn't know how to spell and realized r a lot later that, oh, shit. Yeah. I just got to keep it this way. But doesn't realize search and replace exists. Right. Ooh. Well, and that's a, a modern IDE helps. We those were issues, promised, by the way, that. Flying cars? Yes, <laughs> amongst many other things, paperless offices the and Jetsons, all that shit, right? Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. That. Uh, Time that, machines. That code, namely software code, would be. Would, would transcend language so that someone in a foreign language would be able to write code and I'd be able to see it and interpret it and write it as well. But when you do things like that, like when environment, it's an English language, right? Like that is, right. that is an English word. Then you end up with those issues because when you have non-English developers, yes. those things become easy to happen. But if you made that word not a real mm. word, mm. like just something completely random, do those chances go up or down? I'm sure there's someone much smarter. But then it makes it harder for thing. other people to interpret your code. Because one of my I do's mean, and don'ts. Isn't right? that a thing already, though? I think that it's it's a software development training thing, right? Right. I, going back to in the first segment, right, we talked about our mentors. My early mentors were very talented software developers who I've grown. I appreciate more and more every day as I write code. Where I'm like, I can still remember 20 years ago like being yelled at for doing stupid shit by developers that were like, no, you need to be descriptive in your comments. But mm. Joseph Bentoncourt, who was early developer, very talented. I don't know if you know Joseph. He's uh, I've, uh, I've worked the in name around. Is yeah. familiar. He was one of my early mentors. And when he, he instilled upon me, he said, go read Code Complete, Microsoft Press, highly recommended, right? Mm -hmm. He's like, if you write your code in such a way, you don't need comments. And I, it took me years yes. to understand that. And when I look at code today, sometimes I'll actually strip out a comment because I'm like, you know what? My variable names are descriptive and my logging statement tells me exactly what's going on in this code block. Therefore, when my Jack, 15-year-old intern, looks at this code, I know Jack will be able to understand <coughs> what I wrote without a comment. But I, I want to get on this because the closer you get to natural language programming, so okay. being able to write in, a, in just mm -hmm. almost English, right. the worse this problem becomes, yes. right? This is, this is the problem we're talking about. If you, if you look at coders who are writing code in, like, say, Assembler, yes. so let's go the other, the other sure. extreme. Yep. You don't get that as you much. You don't get that at because, all. Almost. Because now, yeah. I mean, I know all these people who are like Chinese who, who don't speak English very well. And, and they write assembly. assembler. Right. And they don't care because it's, I mean, the instructions exactly. are very, you know, it's like learning a different language. Yeah. It has right. nothing so to do with English. And everyone learns the new language. Right. Versus... And they can read the code, but right. you do, I, I personally think you need commentary and code to help guide people that are looking at systems analysts and whatever. I, I've There's seen a lot of code. challenge with comments and code. Yeah. No one updates it. Well, yeah, that's, that's true. true. They yeah. update the code, but, but they never don't, the comments. Yeah, oh, you're but right. What I like is at the beginning of a function, you describe why it exists, yes. what it does. And that's what probably it does the comments that are most important. Right, yes. Why this why? exists and what it's it, supposed to do. And what it sh you should use it right. for, what you should pass it, and what it returns. I don't need then, you to dock every line. I just yes, want you to tell me what you're is, trying to do. Right. Tell me what you're trying to yeah. do. But when you read the code, if your variable names are descriptive and your logging statements are descriptive, if you've documented that function at the top, my feeling is you don't need very many con yeah. sometimes yeah. if I do something funky I'm like descriptive can be subjective though right because some people and English is really bad at this other languages are much better you know you can use two different words to describe you know how one say extrapolate something right mm -hmm. like there are, yeah. there are multiple different ways to make that descriptive that someone else again a non-native English speaker may not mm -hmm. understand what that means yep. but what's interesting is Joseph taught me also in I, st I can't do this 100% of the time but what Joseph taught me is that if you have to put comments in your code, what it's doing, then it's no boy. Bueno. You're probably yeah. not writing the code the way yeah, it yeah. should be written. You're probably you doing messed something. Up a long time ago. You messed up. You need to rethink the way you implement <coughs> it because when you write it, it should be self descriptive. Ah, you got to put and a and comment and in every line. Yeah. And you're hacking it, right? And we do that as hackers. Like We do that all the time. Uh, like, and, it, and if you want to have fun, go to GitHub and search for I don't know what this does. Mm -hmm. ah, and I ah, was ah, And ah, I was drunk. <laughs> A lot of comments I have in my code are, but I, I, I don't know I, how this works, but it does. I, I'm going to tell you, though, I, I mean, would, just to be you know fair, what, I, I, I have done a lot of, of analyst work on code that was pre-existing. 
uh, and so it was old and it was still in use and we were trying to modify it and I cursed the ancestors <laughs> of the people who wrote this code and did not put do- comment What's interesting, Doug, in. along those lines, in our code base today, there have been four developers. Mm. I can look at a code block, and I'm not saying like I'm a, I have superpowers. You know who right? wrote it. I know who wrote it. I yeah, know no, exactly I who I wrote it. Because I know this developer really struggled with spelling. <laughs> so if the code block I'm looking at doesn't have any spelling mistakes and I haven't touched, right? I haven't touched it. Wasn't that one? I agree, right. get, I agree you with you, Paul. Everyone has their own yeah, style. Yeah, yeah. I right, know, right, and that, well. that's called a chop. That's yep. an, that's the term yes. for that. Yep. But push that downstream ten years, and we're all dead. Whoa! I wait, mean, look whoa, at our wait. look at our lifestyle. Ten um, years. But but I mean, push it I downstream. Got at least Fifteen. Doc, put, well, maybe. <laughs> but push it downstream. The last five aren't so good, though. <laughs> and now somebody's having to look at that code that did not know all those developers, did not know you, that that's trying to carry on. And I know people say, oh, well, the codes are going to be still be running in 15 years. Like, oh, yeah, it is. Mm-hmm. If it works, it's still going to be running somewhere. I mean, maybe in your situation it won't, but in a lot of, a lot of large environments it will be. It'll still be sitting there's, there. It'll there's persist. Cobalt oh, no, no. code in production today. No, no, no. Like it, it there, are, there are pockets of code that I've experienced that what Doug is talking about that persist for 20 years. Because it's the <laughs> – More. Real, or more. Because it's the really hard engineering thing that is the core – when you dig – down deep in the code, that's uh, there's always uh, one piece of code right that you just don't touch. Mm-hmm. TCP IP stack. I mean, yeah. Oh, right? Well, yeah. Do you go rewrite that every few years just <laughs> yeah. to make sure it looks I mean, good? Why, Hell why, no. Wi-Fi. <laughs> yeah. 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 Like all that kind of stuff that you got to work a long time right. ago, and then you don't document it. And guess what? You go back. Even yourself. You go back and look at that code 10 years later, and you're going, what no the hell what I was, was I doing? Right. Was I doing there? And that's why I advocate more for. You know, I mean, I agree with you in certain languages. In certain languages, it's much easier to read that code just yes. without any commentary. But that's not true of every language. No, you're right, Doug. You're right. And, and so you have to be careful about making a, a broad generalization on it. Because like I said, the closer you get to natural language programming, the, the more it's that's true. More of an issue. But the it, further right you get away from it, the harder it is to go back and look at that code a long time. And the more complex the code is as well. If you're trying to solve mm-hmm. very complicated problems, you may well have code that even if it's a natural language, you don't really understand the logic I you're agree. trying to produce. Like Python, Java, Perl, you could write self-descripting yeah. code. Yeah, sure. In C, certain certain Sh- activities in C Starts and especially se- assembly mm-hmm. get mm-hmm. hard to describe without comments. Agreed. Agreed. So Agreed. How, how do we feel about like things like blocky, right? Like the visual coding languages and I think they're great to teach. Right. Yeah. But in practicality, yeah, we're yeah. Gonna, uh, at some fan. point, I think I, you I gotta. Think I think it depends on on what your end motivation is, and you know, m- you know, here at Black Hat, my last two days uh, of training were in doing something similar, in that uh, we were learning software defined radio, mm. and some of the best way to come up with some of the best radio designs is using something like Blocky, mm-hmm. but it's. GNU Radio Companion, where you're dragging radio blocks and you're building radio with drag and drop like scratch, right, for the kids. And but because there is so much complexity behind those blocks, that to write it by hand or to use some of those other blocks is. I think it goes back to our earlier discussion about you've built a Linux box from scratch versus someone has handed it to you. Right. Nothing wrong with that mm-hmm. as long as you can teach that and right. use it as a teachable and moment. That so like that's a hub, continuum. No, it's interesting. HubSpot has these things called workflows, and it's essentially drag and drop programming. Like mm-hmm. if this happens in HubSpot, then, then this, send this, make right. this task, do this yep. thing. And if you've done actual code, you can breeze through that. Mm-hmm. Also, you should carry that forward and teach that to other people that can go in and do that, right? right? So I'm like, this was designed so that any Security Weekly staff member could go in and create a workflow, right? So bring that knowledge forward. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's an, a good use case and, for and, that. And something similar, you know, we, we talked about that. Like the, the example that Mike Osman, you know, iterated to our class was that, hey, if we're going to start analyzing this unknown signal and we need to do clock recovery, we, there's these two functions that we can use for doing clock recovery. And here's this one, clock recovery MM, which is not the best, but it's the easier to use. Mm-hmm. And it's a drag and drop. But the 
math that goes behind this thing it's was coming from the analog from the 1960s. Mm. Wow. wow. And is still very effective. And like, if you want to understand how to re-implement that function, code that function yourself, and know how to call that function, you need to go read these like three books. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I I yeah. think this so is there, a great I think there's I think, there's, I think, yeah, so, yeah, I think yeah. there's a point yeah. and yes. there's a I, I think this yeah. is a great dilemma in programming that has been around and it gets worse all the time. In that, it, and I call it the black box dilemma. And, and it just bleeds back like into this. I you name all the yeah, problems. I do that. <laughs> but I mean, but, but I call it the black box dilemma because, it, it, and it's also the lambda problem, and it's another version of the right, lambda right. problem. We are going to get to a point where we have pieces of code that are so complicated mm -hmm. or that were solved, mm -hmm. and we don't know how they work. And this gets down to this, like you want to build a radio yeah. out of parts or a computer out of parts. Do you need to be able to build a transistor right. in order to build a computer out of parts? No. Well you, well, you can make the argument. Well, you should, because if you're going to put a transistor on that board and you don't know how the transistor yeah. works, how, how, how the hell dare yeah. you use a transistor? And we, and we get like that with yeah. coding, too, because we, we start on that. Well, you shouldn't use this piece of code unless you fully understand it. But the, the issue becomes then... At what point does it just sort of diverge from from you know yeah. from the human spectrum? We go. I just pulled a bunch of pieces together, and I love that. I mean, I love the idea. I could build a piece of code, and I can pull together all these great things and make it work. And I can build a radio or whatever. But at some point, somebody had to understand it somewhere. We're somewhere down I there. I don't want to live in your world though, because in your world, <laughs> <laughs> I reject your reality and substitute my own. Oh, yeah. But in your world, I that do. Means I do all my own experiments. <laughs> That's right. In your world, though, like. The code in in the Tesla then means like twenty years from now, some like kid in the garage is like not gonna know what's going on in there. Like like what happens at that point? Like because code code is becoming but, life, right? But like Gabe, the, it is. The flip side is that if you're gonna do anything with an automobile, you gotta understand every piece of code, operating system, yeah. microchip, and how the car There's no works. room for that to screw up. Yeah, but like, do you have to understand all that to write and code? And there I may I'm not sure. I don't know the answer, but I and, mean. And, and unfortunately, in my world, there, there may well become a point where uh, we can no longer understand it. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, now I've had a lot of drinks, but I no, mean, there may but come a point I, where. I agree. So, Doug, I mean, you teach computer science, right? Like, in a lot of computer science programs, students build their own compilers, their own yeah, right. operating systems. Absolutely. I think that's great. I, do I don't too. think every software developer, some do, some don't. Right. Yeah. I think it's a good exercise, mm -hmm. but not every software. You can study how compilers and operating systems work right. and be a, a, an extremely talented software developer. If you want to go build your own compiler and operating system, great. I think that's a great exercise. I don't think it's a requirement now, to be, especially in today's world where so many layers are abstracted. I don't now, I'm going to join this crowd for a minute and say, look, that's, uh, that's very bad for security. Mm -hmm. no, Not understanding yeah. what you're doing is terrible for security because that transistor that's got something in it that you don't understand, right. that's bad. That's bad. I mean, as, a, as an engineer, though, it works and it does its job. And, and that's been one of the and, – and to get back to the, to the topic, which was one of the problems with security and secure coding is programmers were never taught – to write secure code. Correct. They were taught to engineer code yeah. that worked. Yes. And that means I want to build a piece of code to solve a specific problem. problem. Who cares about the security? That was but never taught. So I would we got to change that. We still that. reinforce these problems because we joke about like lazy developers being the best developers. There's yeah. no room for laziness and security, though. No. But I understand uh, or argue that you don't need to understand every aspect of building I a agree. compiler and operating system, right? I I, take this to a modern example, and I've done this with APIs, right? A lot of times you interface with an API for whatever service or application, right? You, in Python, for example, you go get a library. It abstracts a lot of that hard work away from you. Now, I ran into a situation where the library I was using didn't support a certain function of image uploads. Mm. So I had to write that function from scratch. That Now, that's just one function, one request. Now, I use a library for everything else, but now I understand a lot of things that library is doing because I did that one function call myself. I understand how now I get it, how it works. When I call that other function, I can troubleshoot probably twice as fast as I could before because I understand a small piece uh. of it. So maybe you don't need to build an entire operating system or an and, entire and here, here understand it, some of what it does and it helps you. And I'm going to call this the let the buyer beware problem. But <laughs> I agree with Paul. I think that ultimately we solve this problem because in this gestalt, I got to say it, in this gestalt world <laughs> that we have, 
people will evaluate all these various components, and we will learn over time. Yes. I mean, it's a painful time while you're learning. Sure. Yes. But we will learn over time that Paul's module that does this, even though I don't know how it works because Paul's smarter than me and he wrote a really badass module, but his module is secure and it works and it does the job. Mm. And Doug, I'd say it works. Well, <laughs> but I mean, people will use it and and they sure. will write, they will go on there and go. I have actually thought about open sourcing. And that. they will say, don't yeah. don't use this piece of shit. Or they will say, mm -hmm. oh, this is a good one. And over time, we'll have things to choose from as we pull these things sure. together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and but, but now that now the other question that I've got, Paul, for you is mm. on that is like you've thought about open sourcing that particular image upload problem. But why not go back to that other module that you were using that doesn't contain that functionality and do a pull request to add yours I to should that. Do that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the, the yeah. now that now the question is which do you do? Yeah. Mm. I mean y conceivably you could do both. You yep. could open source it. Yep. Let the community make it better, mm -hmm. right? Would be my motivation for open sourcing it, right. right? Or someone that's struggling with that problem could just easily take it and implement it. Then go back to the this happens to be with WordPress. Go back to that developer, that WordPress library, and be like, dude, the, here's how I implemented uploading images. Not sure why that's not in the code base. If you can use any piece of my code saves go time, for it. go for it. Dude. Like it's no is no secret. Now you've, all three of you got me like I should go. Yeah. But even I'm if it's proprietary, it doesn't even have to be open source. It can be a complete black box that I have no idea how it works. And it, now it's yeah, a transistor. It's, it's, right. It's, it's but I mean, yeah. if it's a bad transistor, mm -hmm. and and I, I learned that, like there were those, uh, you know what an orange drop capacitor is? You probably yeah. do. Well, uh -huh. there was this whole scandal about orange drop capacitors because the, the there were people in China that were cutting them open and putting cheapo capacitors inside of the orange drop and then, and then redipping it. So it looked like an orange drop capacitor. <laughs> Pasture, but it was really an El Cheapo I've capacitor. Seen I've seen that. Well, drop. But yeah. I mean, over time, what will happen is people will learn that Paul's module, even if it's a, if you sell it, I mean, even if I have to pay you a fee to use it, that module is safe it's and worth, secure, right. and I should probably use it. And if I write my own, God knows what will happen. So I'm going to use Paul's safe and secure module. It's got the top rating here from this and this and this, whereas this thing that Doug wrote, oh, my God, it's a total disaster, and, and who knows what it will do. And over time, we can develop modules. So you want to compute pi, you want to compute the, the, you know, whatever, you can do those kind of things, and you can rely on that particular piece of code. And, and that will emerge. That growth period where people have to learn is going to be painful yeah. because that's where you're going to get hacked up pieces because you chose to use Doug's code instead of Paul's and my code sucked and Paul's was really good you don't know how either one of them works and I claimed I knew what I was doing but right. I didn't right and uh, my pie came out to 3.00 we I think we like to think that if Paul or Doug's module or both are open That's source the bridge didn't quite hit the <laughs> no, other side not. <laughs> but it's it, both our modules so are open source so we like to think that the community so can look at those and go Either Paul or Doug's module is, or merge them together and go make these changes. Now, yeah. this, now you've got a third one, right, from Gabe that goes, "This is the module to use." Yeah. As security people, I think that's what we hope will happen. That people will evaluate the code, take the good pieces, apply some security, Look, and push it as forward. Security people, third-party libraries are. Nightmare. The bane of our existence. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And that's yeah. when you, if you do get to open them and look at the code, you go, oh, well, I sure hope they documented this piece of shit, but okay, they never do. Yep. And, and of yeah. course, Kevin yeah. Kevin Johnson, we should have him back on the show sometime soon. We should. Did a, did a talk about this at DerbyCon last year about well, that he inherited third, the, third that party that libraries are killing us, mm -hmm. killing mm -hmm. us from a security perspective. Well, that's mm -hmm. what GitHub is telling me today. Like, I got third party libraries that have some vulnerabilities, right? You mm -hmm. got to deal with that, yeah. right? Yeah. And but that y you don't know in today's world of containers, I build my containers, it every at least every other day if not every day, and every day goes and pulls out new the latest you know versions of modules. Right. Although that depends on your configuration, right? Conceivably, it should test that. But there's so many conditions that could lead to bad. Like I could be pulling this module. I've talked about this on the show before. Pulling this module, and no CVEs, everything's good. Everything tells me it's good. However, the person who developed it, we talked about Paul or Doug's, you know, image upload module. In this case, it was for WordPress. Doug and I got bored and we abandoned it. Yep. And <laughs> yeah, maybe we. But it's, a, but it's open source. If there's a problem, fix it. But the, maybe, the community fix it. Nobody but maybe, it. maybe this one dude, Larry, created this pull request, and I was like, yeah, that's pretty good. You know what, Larry? You can develop it now. But Larry's truly evil. 
And Larry <laughs> starts building evil code into this library. Everyone's including it in there. There's no CVEs. There's no indication it's malicious mm -hmm. until it hits a news headline because someone did some forensics and realized Larry's scraping everyone's WordPress. No, no, no I'm not scraping. You are. Right. I am <laughs> under Larry, right? Because it's yeah. still, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's a problem. Wait till you have to go to court with that. Right. <laughs> yes, Your Honor. Uh, I got to think. I see you. We struggle thinking phone. through that yeah, whole yeah, process, yeah, yeah. right? Never mind a judge and a jury. Oh, like, my, yeah. oh my God. You get good luck at them to understand the problem, right? No, that's like, what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, it's like, I see you're using a flip phone, Your Honor. Uh, right. Yeah. Been there, done that. It's the truth. Thank you, everyone. Great conversation about software security. So with that, we're going to take a short break and come back, hopefully with our next guest. Right on.